I, uh, I've never given, been given a honeydew list before, but I, I got one uh, the day that we were told we can't come into the office. So I've been, I tell my wife every afternoon, I've got to go, uh, I've got to go do a clinic, whether I have one or not. So today I'm going to talk about, um, quarterback development in the air raid. And I'm not so sure that uh, it's much different than developing a quarterback uh, in, in a different offense. I would also say that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the uh, misnomer in North Carolina is uh, that we're just, we're a pure air raid offense, much like the one that uh, coach Leach runs now at Mississippi state and that he has run it at Washington state and at Texas tech, the, the passing game in this offense is, 100% um, the air raid stuff that we have been using for, you know, close to 15, 16 years now. Um, the philosophy offensively is also uh, from that mindset in that we're going to chase space and attack space, but that's also going to be applied to our running game uh, as much as it is our passing game. And I think just the, the maybe the difference between uh, the biggest difference between what Mike does in his system and what we're doing here is probably very similar to what the difference is at Oklahoma um, and some of the other, uh, you know, Cliff stuff at Arizona and whatnot is that there's a much greater emphasis on the run game. Uh, I, I think if we can throw a 15 yard dig or, 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 or run it for four and inside zone, we're going to throw the 15 yard dig um, when all is equal, we're going to take, uh, I think the investment that makes us more money. But um, I, we, we do believe in North Carolina that running the football is a big part of helping us to win championships. And so that's as much of an emphasis here um, as is the pass game. And, and, you know, with being more specific to the quarterback development, we spend, we spend a good amount of time uh, on the mental end of things with quarterback development in the run game, uh, just, just really the same way we do in the passing game. So, there's equal emphasis because there's going to be equal emphasis on the field. And so uh, I think the approach to, to coaching a guy like Sam Howell and some of the other quarterbacks that we've had in this offense in the past um, differs a little bit maybe, and I'll share some of the differences. Um, I will say up front, I don't necessarily claim that what we're doing is any better than what anybody else does. There's, there are plenty of different ways to win football games with your quarterback. The, the way we approach it is what's best for our quarterbacks. Uh, the, the entire goal offensively is to get our guys to play uh, instinctively where they don't have to, to do a lot of thinking. And that's no different when, when I'm coaching the quarterbacks. I want to get to a point where they know the offense. Uh, they understand how to run it. They understand how to execute all the pieces to the puzzle. And I want to continue just to rep and re-rep all of the things that they do in the offense at their position to the point where they don't have to, to think about it very much, if at all. Um, and, and then with that, I would say that uh, we're going to max out at a certain point how many pieces of the puzzle we have so that we're not continually teaching not just the quarterbacks, but any position in the offense, uh, new stuff. You know, our, our staff right now, they would tell you, one of the things that doesn't concern us about missing spring ball in the midst of all of this, you know, this stuff that's going on is that the guys already know the offense. The, the offense is already installed mentally. Spring ball for us was not going to be about teaching new things, uh, new plays, new concepts, new attacks. It was going to be about polishing up and, and re-educating re the things that we did all the way up until the bowl game at Temple. And, and, and just getting our guys back into the speed of doing things the right way and, and in tempo. And so we're going to lose that in the spring, as, as will everybody else. But uh, we've got 35 coaches coming back. We've got 35 veteran offensive players returning this year, and all of whom are going to be able to turn around in line with their respective drills and teach the younger guys what we're doing. Um, so we, we've got our five returning coaches, but we've got 35 players. So we're, we're 40 strong with regards to people who know the, the system and can educate, you know, the new players that came in from this year's signing class. And, and that's always a benefit. And then the second thing will be, we're going to install the offense in four days. Typically, that's what we would do the first four days of spring ball. 
And then from practices five through 15, uh, we're going to rehash and, and polish up and, and correct and improve and upgrade all the things that we do within those puzzle pieces that make up our offense. Um, and so with, with that being said, I'd say more specifically to quarterback development, after I'm done talking here, I'm going to go and put some very basic fundamental drill stuff up that we do. I would like to tell you that we have some more progressive, sophisticated uh, drills at the quarterback position to show you, but we don't because we don't use them. And uh, that's not to say that they're not good, but we're not going to drill anything at the quarterback position in practice that they won't specifically definitively do in a game. So we'll work on our dropbacks because that's what they're going to do in a game. We're going to work a lot on throwing off platform because they're going to be forced to do that in a football game. The stuff that, that uh, we do to develop them physically gets done in the offseason by Coach Hess. And then from a technique standpoint, they're going to get video going into the summer, just like they do every year, of the things that we want them to work on, uh, specifically their footwork in the run game and their footwork in the pass game and their footwork in our screen game. And that stuff is expected to be worked on by them on their own over the course of the summer. And, and you can really tell who, who works on it and who doesn't because you can tell who, who it looks like they're closer to being the final product athletically with regards to footwork at this position when they come to camp. We are tempo the minute we get on the field um, with our drills, with our group drills, and with our, with our team execution stuff. And, and uh, we're, we're not going to slow down for anybody. So it's, there, it's our expectation that every position, including quarterback, knows what's going on mentally before they even get to camp. And then that's one of the reasons that we're able to install the whole thing in four days. The other, the other reason I believe that uh, it, we're able to do that and get, get to improving it and get to playing uh, at an instinctive level sooner is because we're going to have roughly 26, 28, 30 puzzle pieces to the offense that we're going to use. Um, in a smaller uh, nutshell, uh, the offensive line is going to have 12 schemes at the very max. We really very rarely ever use more than eight in a game. But for the offensive line to go into a game utilizing or executing or having to know six, seven, eight, nine schemes, 12 at the very max instead of 20 or 30, gives them an opportunity to play more aggressively, play more instinctively, and, and be physical, which is what we want out of them up front. And that approach is no different uh, to the quarterback position. I don't want our quarterback thinking about a lot of things outside of what's absolutely necessary. And, uh, you know, in this talk in the past, I've, I've said this. Uh, 15, 16 years ago, I used to hand a card that I made that we laminated to the quarterbacks. And it had six or seven different things on the list. You know, they had to put the back on the right side. They had to check the protection. They had to ID the mic. They had to signal to the receivers on the left or the right. You know, they had to ID the box or the coverage. They had to uh, audible or check the play if that's what needed to be done. And then they had to snap the football and execute the play. And it just got to a point where we're taking one of the best football players on the field in our offense, and I'm just I'm mentally handicapping him by giving him so much to do pre-snap. And so 16 years ago, it, it just ended. And, and what I did was we, we decided to get into a world where the quarterback's going to do basically three things. He's going to get the signal. That's one. He's going to, two, either ID the box or the coverage based on whether we're running or throwing, one or the other. And then he's going to snap the football and execute the play. And if the thinking by our quarterback ever has to be any more than that, then we probably will eliminate the play. We want to keep life really, really simple. Now, what he needs to know to execute a run play or execute a pass play, we, we really break it down very simply uh, just like this. In, in the run game, uh, we, we really want them to know based on tags and different things, that different opportunities we provide them in the run game. We just want them to take what the defense is giving us all of the time. And if that means, uh, just, just a quick example, if that means there's an open field hitch five plays in a row, then I want them to throw the field hitch five times in a row. It's boring, but second down and five is a really, really good 
down to call plays. I can be a really, really good play caller on second and five. And so anytime we can get four or five or six free yards uh, in the run game by pitching it out somewhere, then we'll do that. And, and if, if a defense is going to cover everything down and not give us that, it takes a certain amount of defenders to do that. And quite frankly, we're going to run the football. Uh, and, and we want to have confidence when we run the football. So that's about as difficult as his life gets mentally in our run game. In the screen game, you know, it's a lot more about his ego. What we always tell our quarterbacks is in the screen game, I just need them to be an athlete. It's more about proper footwork and putting the throw where it needs to be. We're running an RB screen out of the backfield, an alley screen, if we're throwing a bubble screen, if we're throwing a swing screen, if we're throwing a jailbreak, that's more about the quarterbacks taking proper footwork, being good athletes, and making throws on the move, putting them at certain strike points on the receiver so we can catch and protect the ball and get up the field. You know, there's not a lot of thinking that to be done in the screen game. So when we call a screen, I'm simply asking him to be the athlete that we recruited when we signed him in the first place. So life is really, really simple when we throw screens. The only golden rule we have in a screen game is we're never going to throw the ball over a defender to a point where we have to elevate the ball. If we have to elevate the football or loft it in the air in the screen game, we're not throwing it. We want to snap the ball off. We want to throw line drives in our screen game. We want to get the ball there yesterday so our guys can retrieve it at running back, tight end, and wide receiver and, and get up the field vertically and gain yardage. And if we can't do that in the screen game, the ball's going to go in the dirt. And then lastly, in our passing game, um, and this is oversimplification of his job in the passing game, but it's protection and progression. And that's it. ID, anything that you need to change in the protection if I didn't call the right one. And, and if, I, if, I'm, if I'm dumb that day and don't make any good calls in protection, he's going to change it and he's going to make us right. And, and he'll take care of protecting himself. Want the quarterback always to know uh, – where the weakness is or where the defender or defenders are that he's responsible for. So we're going to manage that at quarterback. And I think everybody that plays us knows that. And then after that, it's about his progression. So we're going to, we're going to do less reading of defenders and we're going to do more progression stuff in our past game because everything is built on and developed around our quarterback being able to get rid of the football and getting it out of his hands as quickly as we can. Always tell them if they can complete a pass faster than we're, we're uh, teaching them to execute doing it, then, then go ahead and do it. Anytime we can complete a ball faster than originally planned in the concept, then go ahead and do it. We'll always take the four or five easy yards before holding or bypassing something simple and, and, and attempting to put the ball down the field. The last group of guys on our side of the football that we ever want to stress are the offensive line. So I don't want to hold the ball and make their life more difficult in pass protection. I don't want to add multiple schemes and make their, diff their life more difficult mentally. I want them to be physical. We want them to play downhill. We want them to be aggressive. We want them to play confident. And when they get all those things going, then they're playing instinctively without having to do a lot of thinking. And it's no different at quarterback. So those are the things in the screen game, pass game, run game that um, we define. And the things that I'm telling you are exactly the same things that we tell them when they come in. I'm looking at the same checklist right now that uh, we hand them when they come in to play quarterback. One, one thing that we do that, that um, I think has always been a benefit, and I, and I really, if I was more prepared, I could show you this, but there's a positional checklist that we have for every position in the offense. And on that positional checklist, it's a one-page deal that has the entire life of that position on the page. And what we're asking our coaches to do is put everything that the tight ends, the running backs, the O-line, the receivers, my quarterbacks need to know to properly uh, execute and, and be mentally prepared to play their position. Now, whether or not that transitions into good play on the physical end of it on the field is another question. Then it's our job to get them out on the field and teach them the techniques and get them to execute the plays at a level that's high enough that they can contribute to winning football games at North Carolina. But before we ever take the field, they've got to know the checklist. And it includes all their drills. It includes all their techniques. It includes everything they have to know in the run game, pass game, screen game. It includes all the logistical things, formations, motion shifts, back sets, all that stuff that they need to know. It just helps instill a little confidence in, in my experience 
when a player can look at a one page piece of paper and say, hey, if I know what's on this page, I'm mentally prepared to play my position. So quarterbacks are no different and I hand them that stuff. And, and this is coming right off of that. Um, from a, from a, a requirement standpoint, uh, recruiting, but really more what, what do they need to have to play quarterback in this offense? It may be different in somebody else's offense. Um, but there's, there's two prerequisites at quarterback in, in this system they have to have before they ever come to campus. And so from a recruiting standpoint, those are the two things that I'm evaluating on film that I'm looking for because those are the necessities. Those are the things, these are the two things they have to have if they're ever going to have any success in this system. And the first one is arm talent and more specifically, uh, it's, it's accuracy. So they have to have a certain amount of arm strength to get the ball to certain places on certain type of routes. Their balls need to finish at the end of throws. And, you know, those, those are the reasons that you want to go and watch guys throw uh, actively and in, in real life so that you can see if, if they can accomplish the things they need to do. So arm strength slash accuracy, you, you can give up a little bit on arm strength if they throw the ball accurately. And, uh, you know, we, we, I've coached guys in the past that have incredible arm strength. And, and yet they, they can't throw routes accurately. They, they can't hit an end cut or they can't hit the deep ball. You know what I mean? Or, or, or they can't make simple throws on a consistent basis with automatics. Automatics to us are simple quick throws, slants, out hitches, swings, bubbles, you know, now screens to wide receivers. If they can't throw those things at 100% clip, they can't play here because that's the expectation. So if, if you have the strongest arm quarterback in the world here at North Carolina and he's not accurate, he'll never play. And, and on the other side of it, he could be really, really accurate. But if, if we can't reach certain targets in a specific time period, then it, it, it becomes more and more difficult for a kid to play. But I would say accuracy is the number one aspect of the arm talent um, area of quarterback play that, that I feel like I need to have to coach a guy in this system. The second thing is uh, their ability to learn. So if they're, if they're not good students in school, it doesn't necessarily mean they can't learn football, but I, I'd really rather have a guy that handles himself on the field and in school. You know, I'd rather have a guy that has proven intellectually, cognitively, he's, he's a bright kid and he can learn the game. You know, and the flip side to that, it's, it's twofold. How much do they want to learn? Are, are, are they film junkies? Are they X and O's junkies? Are they football junkies? What kind of uh, teaching and learning background do they have? You know, I almost always love players, quarterbacks that come from families with coaches because it's an advantage. It's unfortunate for the guys that don't have uh, dads that coach them um, or don't have a, a, you know, a football background. But the reality is that's an advantage. It's not a, a necessity, but it helps. And then, you know, the second thing is, do they have coaches on staff that spend a lot of time with them work with them, challenge them from an X's and O's standpoint. Can they get on the board and, and uh, draw up power for me? Can they get on the board and, and dissect defensive coverages? Can they get on the board and thoroughly explain in a way that the entire room of skill players would understand how to go out and run four verticals? You know, those, those guys are hard to find, harder to find than you think. And, um, you know, they're, that's really what I'm looking for. The, the less I have to – work hard to teach a kid, the more, the more uh, readily available he is and the, and the more open he is to learning, the easier it's going to be to teach him everything. And then the way we look at it is it's our job Monday through Friday to, to prepare him mentally. We want to recruit a physical talent that can already go make the plays in the offense that we want. I don't want to have to change the throwing motion, improve technique. Doesn't mean we won't try and do that. But the less we have to address physical disadvantages or physical um, shortcomings in a quarterback, the more interested I am in him because it gives me an opportunity to get to the mental stuff even faster. We can spend more time on the mental stuff and less time on the physical stuff, the closer they are to being a finished throw product. Um, with regards to the quarterback being a good athlete, um, I'm never going to take a superb athlete who, who can't throw the ball accurately over a kid who can throw accurately and think and lead. But of course, we'd all like to have a kid that can do all of those things. 
So if, if he can throw the football and he's accurate and he's athletic, and I think we have a few of those guys here at North Carolina right now, then they can, they can extend some plays or make some plays with their feet, both in the passing game and in the running game. You know, that's, you're living in a really good world when you have a guy that um, is, is a junkie from an X's and O's standpoint. Um, is really, really accurate throwing the football and can actually make some plays with his feet. And, you know, that's the perfect trifecta. And that, that's not always possible to find every year. Uh, I've been very blessed over the years to have a few of those guys. And, and you know, you, they're fun to coach. So those are the, the, the arm talent accuracy and, and the ability to learn the offense, which sounds pretty simplistic. But uh, – very few guys really overly impress me when I talk football with them coming out of high school. I think those guys are harder to find than maybe uh, you, you, would, you would think, you know, you would readily think initially. So when we find a guy that have those two things, you know, then we move on to the other things that are obviously necessary. Their mental development is, is paramount when they get here. Um, you want to get them to a point where they know everything without having to think about it because you want them to play the game instinctively. And all of those things that you recruit them for athletically from an arm talent and an athletic ability standpoint, you really can never appreciate what they can do fully from an arm talent standpoint or from an athletic ability standpoint until they know what they're doing. So you have to get through the mental curve and the mental development and the X's and O's development before you can ever truly appreciate 100% of what they can do from a skill standpoint because they're going to be hesitant until they're absolutely sure about what they're doing on each and every play. You know, I think uh, you're always looking for kids that are competitive. You're looking for kids that, that want to learn continually. And one of the challenges, even right now, as, as young and as early in, this, in the process as it is with our current starting quarterback, Sam Howell, who's only going to be a true sophomore this year, I'm already to a point where I have to uh, – do a really, really good job of preparing meetings for him and preparing things that are going to help him continue to develop and challenge him and keep his interest because he's done such a, a phenomenal job of learning the offense and excelling it at it in this first year. Um, and, and, and he is exceptional. And so uh, it's been fun to teach him because I really only have to tell him something once or twice. It's learned. It's remembered. It translates on the field. Um, and that's not always the case. Uh, with the quarterbacks that we've had in the past. Uh, the better job you do of recruiting or, or even at the high school level, finding that seventh, eighth, ninth grader, 10th grader in your, in your district that can throw accurately, which is what I looked for when I was in high school. Can he throw accurately and can he learn the offense? And it really the, the approach and the process was no different back in the late 90s when I was coaching high school football than it is now. If anything, uh, we've made life simpler for the college guys now than it was then. And I, and I stopped trying to teach our guys everything that I know about the sport of football. I don't need to impress them. What I need them to do is understand how to execute the plays we're running on Saturday. I need them to know that by Friday. If I do my job well of preparing him mentally from Monday to Friday, I really shouldn't have much to do other than do a good job of calling plays and putting him in a position to be successful on Saturday. So from a requirement standpoint, after the two prerequisites, we're looking at their leadership ability. We're looking at their mental development, which is my responsibility and theirs. We're looking at uh, how close can I get them to playing instinctively before they ever start a game here. Um, and then their physical abilities, the better runner they are, the more we're gonna utilize their talents in the run game, the more we're gonna teach them to scramble and instead of throwing away. And the more we're going to utilize their movement in the pocket in the pass game to, to benefit our offensive line. Uh, you know, and, and, and hopefully we, we do a good job both at your level and at mine at recruiting guys that are inherently competitive. Um, and so, you know, that in a nutshell is, and, and it's probably what everybody's looking for, but that's, those are the key things for me. I just think those two prerequisites are what they have to have before they get on your roster. And then the rest of it is our responsibility here anyway as, as a quarterback coach for myself of developing those other areas in our quarterback. From a, from a development standpoint, once they get here, you know, I would say that uh, we don't have an offensive playbook. The reason we don't have an offensive playbook is so that the guys have to draw it up themselves. They're going to write it in a way that makes more sense to them um, than we are in the playbook. 
The other thing is we, we, we provide so much flexibility for them with regards to running routes and, and drop backs and footwork at the running back position and technique on the O-line that to, to define just one way of doing things that may not fit every athlete that we have uh, to me is counterproductive. And so I don't want to draw a post route in the playbook that's going to look five different ways once our guys learn how to effectively run it. And so instead of defining all that in a playbook, we're going to teach it to them on film, and then we're going to teach it to them in walkthrough or run-throughs, probably the two best ways that human beings learn anyway, is show it to them visually, and they can translate what they see, and then we're going to go out and we're actually do it on the field. And so what they write and what they draw in our meetings off of film is what becomes their playbook. And that's especially true and, and probably the most important with regards to uh, our quarterbacks because they're going to draw it up themselves and develop their own playbook. Uh, the other thing is I, I think to get them to understand uh, what's on the positional checklist and to get them to understand what the, let's say, the quote-unquote 28 pieces to the puzzle are going to be, once they know how to execute um, those 28 puzzle pieces, then they become interchangeable and we can put them together any way we want and there's no new teaching for the quarterback or the skill players because they already know it. We're just doing it maybe in a different order in conjunction with different plays each week. We're going to put those pieces together to develop our game plan as, as we see fit for that particular week, but it won't be new learning for any of our guys, particularly at quarterback. We believe, and I have learned over the years from my experience that the sooner we get them to play instinctively by keeping things simpler, the more explosive we become, the faster we can run the offense. Even if we weren't running tempo, the faster we play post whistle or post snap because we don't have a lot of thinking to do. Instinctively run a post route that can break off on four different angles instead of worrying about being at a certain area of the field at a certain time. Not saying it's right, it's just what we do in our offense and it works for us. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to I'm going to switch over, and uh, I'm just going to show you some fundamental drills that we do with our quarterbacks um, just about every day, particularly in camp. Um, and our guys are bored in practice a little bit. I'm I'm not we're not running uh, some of, some of the clinic drills that you see online that that look so fun and and uh, require 14 different apparatuses to to, to execute the drill. We're simply going to grab a football, occasionally use a cone, and we're going to go through only those things that we need to execute to, to, you know, to fundamentally execute plays, that we need to technique to fundamentally execute plays. We go through the playlist. I say, hey, here's power, okay? Well, in power, what does our quarterback need to do? He needs to know X, X footwork. He needs to know a specific type of mesh. And, and that's all he needs to know in the power. And I'm not going to teach any more than that. And then we'll teach him how to, to pull it if he needs to pull it on a particular run play. And that's it. And that goes on our, our drill list for the quarterbacks. And then we go to the inside zone and we go to counter. and We go to, you know, the run plays that we use. We go to our screen library of, of plays and how many different uh, ways do we utilize footwork to throw our screens. Let's say it's three. Fine. I'm going to teach him those three aspects of footwork for those three screens, and that's all we're going to do. What are the problems that come up with pass drops? We're going to learn the pass drops that we use, all right? And that's all we're going to teach them. And then you go back, and in the run game, in the screen game, in the pass game, what problems can arise? Specifically on a pass drop, we can get pressure right up to shoot right in front of us. So how do we handle that? So I'm going to, I'm going to three-step casual, three casual drop, and I have pressure through a gap. Well, I've got to rep for the quarterback what we do to handle A-gap pressure. What do we do when pressure comes off the edge? All right, what do we do when we have to sprint out and throw on the run? So we'll utilize all the problems that arise, all the realistic situations that come up in a game to add to our drills library off the drop back. And we're not going to do anything. Our guys are not running uh, the field and doing karaoke. They're not doing uh, – footwork drills that they don't do in a game. We're not on the ropes and doing all that stuff in practice. That stuff all has its place. It improves 
you know, eye-hand coordination, it improves dexterity, it improves hip flexibility, it improves foot, foot quickness, all that stuff. But we're not doing that in practice in preparation for a game. That's the stuff that they do with Coach Hess. That's the stuff that they do on their own in the spring and the summer, you know, off of uh, instruction that we, we, we give them from the spring or off videotape or off the positional checklist that they're responsible to improve and develop before they get to camp. And then we're going to work specifically only on the things that they have to do instinctively every day. Uh, Coach, if you want to click me off, uh, I'm going to. Yes, sir. I'm going to just, you know, and then put the, the full screen for some of the drills. And I'll go through some of this stuff for our guys. You're good, Coach. All right. I apologize. We have some better film. There's probably about 70% of this film, 80% of this film is right here for North Carolina, which is what I prefer. I have a couple clips uh, where the film in North Carolina wasn't so great, and so I, I pulled it from our Ole Miss stuff just to show you. And, you know, we utilize a, a, uh, a library of three drops in our entire passing game, and that includes um, – and, and it's really 55 60% of what we do on every play is we drop back, either off of play action or, or off of straight drop back to throw the football. And then 45 to 50, sometimes 55% of the time, we utilize our run footwork. So that's a big part of what we drill in practice. And then as we get really, really good at it, sometimes we satisfy the need to execute that stuff just in our team or our group reps. And then we'll start utilizing the, the uh, individual time that we have to handle the problems that arise when we pass drop or we go through our run footwork. This is, uh, one of, this is the first drop that we teach. This is a top gun drop, and that's exactly – it is exactly what it sounds like. We're going to catch the ball in the gun. We're at the top of the drop already. And all we're going to do is uh, if we're a right-handed quarterback, then we're going to call our right foot our trigger foot. And all we're going to do is pick up our trigger foot and put it back down and throw the quick game. So here the quarterbacks are all going to turn their, their trigger foot on a, on a little bit deeper angle than it would be if it were perpendicular to the line to the sideline. We want it to be turned a little bit deeper if they're throwing to their front side. So if I'm a right-handed quarterback, I've got to get my right foot, my trigger foot turned just a little bit deeper than where it would be if it were perpendicular to the sideline to get my hips around. And I want to throw the ball to my front side in two steps. So basically what they're doing is they're going to open their right toe up after they collect the ball get their left foot down, and then they're going to release the football. You know, and most of the time, we're not, we're not uh, going through this entirely right now, but as we get into drills during the season, I'm going to ask them all to ghost throw everything because I want their hips and their upper body to go through the throwing movement that they would if they throw. So this quarterback right here, the third one in the line, that's a true ghost throw, and that's what our guys will do as we progress on every rep where we're not actually throwing the football. So it's right foot, left foot, balls out. And then depending on the, the route that we throw, there's a tempo with regards to each of the quick routes that we have. So their footwork for a hitch is the same as it would be for a slant or an out, but the tempo at which they top gun drop or um, rhythm through their drop and throw is a little bit different. If we're throwing hitches, it's like turning a double, a double play. We've got to get it there yesterday. If we're throwing slants, we're going to step through our top gun drop casually, and then we're going to trigger the ball to the belly of the receiver on an in-cut like a slant. If we're throwing an out route, the out route takes a little bit longer than the slant. The slant takes a little bit longer than the hitch. So if we're throwing an out route, we're going to be real, real casual about our footwork, and then we may frame for a picture initially before we trigger on the out because the out's going to take you know, that extra two-tenths of a second to break and show itself as a target. And so that's how we practice. This is just the reps that we go through when we go throw to our front side. This next rep is when we go through throwing to our backside. We're still going to step with our trigger foot. We still want the ball gone in two steps. We're still going to rhythm through what route we're throwing. You know, they'll, they'll throw it there yesterday. And from a mental standpoint, we're going to get it there quickly. A slant, we're going to get it there quickly but comfortably. And an out route, we know we can. there's going to be a little bit of a hesitation before we have to trigger. But the footwork is going to be the same. 
It's right foot, left foot. Some of these guys are going to place their right foot right next to their left foot. Some of them will place it just behind their left foot. Some of them are actually going to short step with their right foot. I don't care which one of the three that they do. What I do care about is that they do it quickly and they do the one that's comfortable for them. And then their left foot will hit the ground immediately afterwards and they're in a position to throw the football. So if you look at the front quarterback right here, he likes placing his foot. He basically skips it. He's going to put his right foot, his trigger foot, right down on the grass next to his left foot. And then he's going to step with his left foot and gain a little ground in the direction of the target. And now we're throwing to his backside. His hips and his shoulders are already open and we can trigger the ball just as fast to our backside as we can to our front side. The, uh, the fact that we maintain parallel shoulders to the line of scrimmage on our drop, I, I, I don't debate that it's better or, or not as good as uh, any, any type of the drops that are being utilized where people front out. We utilize it because our completion percentage to our backside has improved almost 10%. Our completion percentage to our front side has not decreased at all. And so since we started going to uh, the drops that we utilize where our shoulders are parallel, one, I think one benefit is we don't tip off where we're going as quickly. Uh, the second thing is we're not a little bit later to our backside like we used to be when we fronted out. And three, um, we can see the field a lot easier from a pressure standpoint, a coverage standpoint, um, and a route standpoint. And I don't believe that we tip off where we're going as quickly when we keep our shoulders square. So those are the reasons that we use it. You may buy that, you may not. That's fine. I'm just telling you what we do and, and we think it's, uh, it's effective for us. So this is the two-step drop with regards to throwing quick game to our backside. Here it is in the game with Sam Howell at North Carolina. So he's going to throw to his front side. He's stepping right foot, left foot, balls down, balls out. I mean, uh, feet are down, balls out. Right, left, balls out. And that's throwing front side. He is opening his shoulder more because he's throwing front side, and he knows it pre-snap. He knows where he's going with the ball, at least from a which side standpoint. He knows he's going quick game-wise. He's going to go over here. He's scanning on this particular play inside out. He likes the first target, and so he's able to pull the trigger immediately on the slant or the quick post off of his top gun drop. If we have a drop, coaches, that really uh, we utilize a three quick drop or a three casual drop in our offense, and because they're vacating the grass and we know we may trigger it faster, our quarterbacks are going to go to the top gun drop and trigger it quicker on their own because they know that's the drop that they need to get the ball off. Instead of trying to three quick or three casual, which takes longer, and having to pull up short in the middle of the drop and throw the ball, they'll just adjust like Sam is here. And he'll go to a top gun drop and he'll trigger the ball and get it out right now. Another here it is from the end zone. Collect the ball, right foot, left foot, ball's out. That's it. And we want them really comfortable. And if they're comfortable and they're triggering the ball on time and it's accurate, I don't care if it looks like the perfect form that we want in every quarterback. You know, it, it, it really doesn't matter to me unless the ball comes out really, really low in an arm slot, which means it can get batted down. I don't care what their throwing motion is like. I care that the ball is accurate and that they're getting it out in time. If they get it out in time and it's accurate, why is anything else important? That's, that's the question that I ask. And so those are the only two things that we work on. I have no interest in trying to change the throwing motion of a quarterback. If I have to do that, I probably wouldn't recruit him. Here he is throwing a quick swing to the back. This is just quick stick to the tight end. All right, he's got a little cheat step with his left foot, but the drop itself is right foot, left foot. So it's top gun, right foot, left foot, balls out right now. And really his hips don't ever change here. This is such a short, quick throw. It's gonna be more of a wrist throw than it is a throw that we wanna generate through our hips and our shoulders. 
that takes longer. And we don't need it. We don't need a throw like that that takes longer when we're throwing hitches, slants, and out routes. So we're going to risk throw a lot of that stuff. You won't see our, our guys go through hip rotation and, and shoulder rota- shoulder twist and, and, and that whole deal, throwing a shallow mesh to a receiver underneath. It, it simply takes the arm, the, the arm strength and the wrist strength that we have to get the ball out quickly and accurately, and that's the way we throw it. One, two, balls out. You know, I would say that I, I won't say that I never coach our quarterbacks to change things that they do. I do want to change things that they don't do well. One of the things that Sam does that I have found uh, over the years is very hard to break is the fact that he pats the ball before he throws it. Now, looking at every throw from his throw tape from this season, I don't believe that him patting the ball has made the ball come out later. He does it, and he does it in a, in a, in a, a time frame that it hasn't affected him with regards to release time, and he's been able to quickly get the ball out. So it hasn't affected that. The other thing is I couldn't really find any examples where defenders got to jump on a ball because he pats the ball. And that's always a concern because sometimes when quarterbacks pat the ball, it does. It, it, it keys that he's throwing it and guys get a jump on it. I wasn't able to find any evidence of that this year. I'm still trying to break him of the habit. It's not easy. And I'm not going to go to the point where he's throwing the ball uncomfortably just to get him out of doing that. And so as long as he's on time and as long as he's accurate, I'll keep trying to coach it out of him. But if I don't, we know that he can be effective with what he's doing. Coach, come over here and put this on the big screen again. I I hit it somehow. Thank you, sir. So here he's throwing a a swing screen that's completely lateral to him. And so the more lateral that he's going to be to his front side, the deeper that first foot is going to be. So his toe is almost pointing to the pylon in the end zone behind him so that he can get his hips all the way around. If the target were here, that, that right foot wouldn't have to get turned as far. If the target were out here by the wide out, it would turn a little further as that target rounds out and, and becomes something that's more lateral and in our backfield, then that right toe is going to get pointed further back so that his hips can get all the way around. And he's doing a really nice job of getting his feet around. He's casual. He's comfortable. He's throwing a really accurate ball. And, and that's, that's really the only goal. That's all we want. And so in slow-mo, it's just a big first step. Left foot hits the ground. Ball is out. We're putting velocity on it, but we're not knocking the running back over with it. It's accurate. It's good. We're snapping it off and getting it there. We want to give him a nice catchable ball so he can square his shoulders and get up the field. All right, this is a, one of the drills that we do because most quarterbacks that come to us are not um, coming from a, a backpedal drop. They're not used to being in a backpedal mode and then setting themselves and throwing the football. And so this is just a drill that we go through with them um, and that we also show them. And, and, and this is a drill we do in all of our high school camps. And we just want to see their transition from a very casual backpedal into their throwing demeanor. We're not going to fly out of there and lead the backpedal with our head like the pros used to drop from under. You watch John Elway and guys like Terry Bradshaw and Dan Marino, the old school guys from under, get into a five or a seven step drop and their head is way out ahead of their shoulders, their butt and their heels. And then they get to the back of the drop and they square up and do their thing. We are trying to keep our nose over our toes. We're trying to keep our shoulders over our hips. And we are really just in a fast walking back pedal. Very, very comfortable. We don't ever want to move quick enough that we have to tense up our upper body at all. You know, one of the things that I got from Coach Leach um, and from Graham Harrell watching him play and talking to him about how he, one, did things when he played and two, work the quarterbacks in practice at Washington State was how relaxed they were. They're relaxed from their teaching in the classroom with the way they think about things. They don't stress over a lot of things. And so they play calm and they play relaxed. And then when they drill things, 
you know, they do things in a very relaxed manner. And so they're never really tense upper body. And so we look like we're just kind of throwing in the backyard. And that's the way we want to look on our drops. And then when we work through, and you know, now I, I skipped past that, but we will walk the field and do it. And then we're, we're just going to, uh, and I, I went too far, I'm sorry. We're going to walk the sideline and just have them backpedal, set, throw. Backpedal, set, throw. And then as they get comfortable doing that, we'll weave or the target will weave to the right and the left so that they get used to planting their foot on different angles and throwing to their left and to their right. And I did it again. So as you walk across the field with them, they're in a casual walk. This is them setting and throwing. And then you give them different angles and they do that with their feet. I'm working with Matt Corral here from Long Beach Poly and he's at Ole Miss right now. And this was his first couple days ever of doing this and it was completely foreign to him. If you're thinking about doing this, I'd be happy to send drill tape and I'd be happy to talk to you about it. I will tell you that your quarterbacks are gonna be incredibly uncomfortable with it the first day or two. And within a week or, or so of, of doing it and throwing the football, they're not going to want to do anything else. That, that's been my experience with everybody that we've, we've taught it to because it's uncomfortable and unnatural at first. And then after a while, it becomes just so easy and so relaxing that they're able to trigger the ball. Now, this drop right here is the second drop in the offense. And this is just three casual for us. And that's exactly what it is. Our plant foot is already down with regards to their footwork. I don't care if they want to stagger with their right foot in front, stagger with their right foot in back, or be completely parallel. It doesn't matter to me. I want them to start wherever it's comfortable. The only thing I ask them is be in the same spot in the passing game as you are in the run game. So we want their footwork, once they, they learn what they like most and what they're comfortable with in their pass drop, then we teach them all their run footwork from that exact alignment in the run game. So they're where they want to be to drop back in the passing game. And, they're, and they're, we're going to teach from that stance where they need to be in the run game. This is three casual. We want to make sure that the apex of his body is upright, is vertical from the ground. We don't want him leaning back. We don't want all the weight on the back foot. All the same things that we teach when they get to the throwing demeanor, the trigger, the trigger position. We want all that from this drop. We're just going to drop with more parallel shoulders with the same ability to throw front side and to throw back side. It gives us, uh, I think we're better look off. We're, be we're, we're better at looking off when we have parallel shoulders. It's easier for our guys to see both sides, especially their backside. Um, it doesn't take us as long to get our hips open to throw to our backside because they're already there. And if anything, you just have to police them not being open too far when they throw to their backside. But that's, this is about as perfect as a three casual drop is going to look. And then the last drop that we have, and we'll get to it, is a three quick drop. This is three casual by all four. Gain ground on your first step and your second step. Make sure we're coming to balance on the third step. And, and, and we're in balance and we're where we want to be. I would say that the first quarterback right here, if you really watch him, is a little bit on his heels. And when he gets back to the third step, and this is day one or two of doing this because we're not in gear yet, his, the apex of his body is not quite up and down. He's leaning back subtly. Like he's, he's leaning back a little bit too much for me. Whereas uh, Jordan Tamu, who you're watching play for the Battle Hawks and now the Kansas City Chiefs, he's more upright and balanced. That's where we want him to be after that third step. That's just three casual, and now here's three casual thrown to the backside. Reach for a little grass on the first step. Uh, number two is probably reaching a little too far on the first step initially. We're over coaching it. The second quarterback, Jordan, who's been doing it a while, is really exactly where we want him to be. One, two, three, set. They're really comfortable. They're really light on their feet. There's no tension in their upper body and their regular trigger right now. I don't like hold them holding the football below their chest because I want them to be able to get into the trigger position with the ball up around their shoulder area. And that is also flexible as long as they can get the ball out quick. 
I just don't want the elbows low. I don't want the ball low. So we waste time raising the football up to trigger it. So our trigger position is from chest to shoulder. And we want to have our shoulders over our hips. And we want to be fairly balanced until we transition our weight from our back foot to our front foot to trigger the football. And here's Sam on a, just a three casual drop. Throwing a fade down the sideline. One, two, three, he likes it. Um, there are certain throws like this sideline fade that will baby hitch at the top. And that's what he's doing here. So after the, the cheat step, there's one, two, three. You know, baby hitch it and let it roll. And, and that's what we want. The ball is coming out in time. I'd like him to push this ball down the field a little bit more, but that has nothing to do with the drop. You know, it probably can elevate his arm or elevate the, the uh, launch point just a little bit. Outside of that, we like everything here. And that's what three casual should look like. So here's a little bit of a cheat step, and then we're going one, two, three. Baby hitch, he gathered his feet that time, and, and now we're, we're throwing a, a little bit more of a velocity shot to a fade because he has separation. You know, and throwing fades, that's a whole different conversation. Cheat, one, two, three, hitch, throw. More velocity, uh, less height when there's separation by the receiver. We got a receiver here working out away from coverage. You know, which is an aspect of the air raid stuff where we're constantly working to chase space. And Sam is landmarking his outside number to keep the, to protect the ball away from the defender. That's his goal here. One, two, three, plant, balls away, and, and we're in pretty good rhythm there. The ball is kind of hitting him right on the outside number. I'd really like him to push it more, maybe towards the armpit, just to protect the ball from the defender. But the drop we like. You know, the biggest thing here is he's not late, okay? He's, he's throwing just as accurately as he was at any other drop, you know, and he's making a decision in good time. And, and really, that, that's what you want out of your drop. So I, I don't want to force feed him a drop or a technique. Um, if I know that if he's close enough to doing what we want and he's comfortable and the ball's on time, we're happy with it. No wasted movement, no added time to stress the offensive line. Here's a field speed out. It's a three-step speed out by the receiver. Now, this is a really good example of three quick. And all three quick means is we're going to take the first initial step of our three casual drop. But he realizes that either the throw is longer or further away, or we have to quick trigger something. And so we're going to speed up our feet. So the rhythm of three casual should be one, two, three, throw. The rhythm of three quick is going to be one, two, three, and then we're going to throw it. So if we have to accelerate steps two and three to get them down to pull the trigger quicker, then we're going to. And that's all he's doing here. If you watch it, it's subtle, but it's definitely different. So he's taking his first step casually, one, and then he's going to speed up two and three. One, two, three. One, two, three. And the reason he's doing that is he's making a long throw to a three-step speed out to the field. One, two, three. So he shortened it. He won't get quite as much depth. But the ball is also going to come out quicker than if he just went three casual and then he hits and he threw. And so those are, in a nutshell, those are our three drops. Top gun three quick or three casual and three quick. I don't ever teach them three quick until they're good at three casual. So again, you want them to have the library of drops down and have worked on it at least enough to have an assemblance of uh, feeling comfortable with it before they ever get into a practice and start throwing an ROA or Skelly or team. And then, you know, the key is we go to this drop drill, it's boring. We're not using anything. I will, I'll use this opportunity, too, to tell you we don't ever throw to a net. We own nets. We're not going to use them. I almost want to donate, donate them to a program somewhere because I don't, I don't want our quarterbacks throwing more throws during the week than their arm can handle. We want to keep their shoulder and their, and their elbow healthy. And I want, to have, I want the quarterbacks to have the same velocity at the end of the year that they do at the beginning. 
And if you're not careful, that may not necessarily be the case. So we, we definitely chart the number of throws, the velocity of throws, the distance of throws, so that we can keep them healthy. But we want to win the war of attrition with the quarterback's arm the same way we do with the physical health of our linemen up front throughout the course of the, of the season. Um, the other thing is, uh, and I, I make that point so that I can say this, I don't want to waste throws at a net. Receivers can't catch enough footballs. They can never catch enough footballs. And the more that they catch footballs doing it with proper technique, the better they're going to get and the closer they're going to get to catching the ball instinctively. So anytime we throw the ball that is not to a receiver, it's going to be to each other. And there are very few drills like this where we're throwing to each other. I would much rather have three receivers here as witnessed by the complete unathleticism of one of our coaches. So we'd rather have a receiver there collecting the football. Here's a top gun drop by our quarterback. Ball's out now. The ball is in the box. The box is defined as the shoulder joints to the hip points of the receiver. We want the ball to be in the box there on any in cut. And we're, we're converting a third down here against Clemson. And a lot of it, I think, has to do with a really good drop. So he's top gunning here, doesn't like it. We're going to reload our feet and we're gonna put the ball in the box on the slant. We didn't talk about reloading yet, but as we move around the pocket, it may look like we're a little more jittery than some. We don't want our guys doing the NFL hop where both feet are leaving the grass at the same time. We're constantly pity padding our feet left and right, up and down in an effort to continually re-trigger our throwing foot. So we're gonna lift our feet up enough to legally say that they're off the grass and then we're gonna put it right back down again. And our feet are bouncing back and forth like that. So we're continually reloading our trigger foot and we're ready to throw. And that's all he's doing here. Top gun to a short route, it's not there. He's reloading his feet to the second progression and he's putting the ball in the box on a slant route against Clemson on third down. Here's a throw against Miami. We're top gunning outside to a swing or a quick slant. He doesn't like it, so we're going to the second progression. We're reloading our feet, and then he's making the corner throw that helped us win the ball game against Miami. Top gun, no, reload, reload, balls out, corner touchdown. Now, off of play action, the same three drops apply. So if we're gonna, we have three different fakes in our run game or in our play action game. We're going to poke it. We can glide fake or we can ride fake. A poke is just exactly what it sounds like. We'll put the ball in the belly of the running back and then we're gonna pull it out, top gun drop, which is popping our feet right, left, and then we're gonna throw it. If we glide, we're gonna put the ball down towards the running back at our hip and we're gonna ride the fake to our other hip. And then for all intent and purposes, we're gonna pull and make whatever throw we're making. A ride fake for us is we're going to present the ball outside the framework of the quarterback, ride the running back outside the framework of the quarterback on the other side, and then we're going to pull and throw a much deeper ball. So it's the length of the fake that we're defining with a poke, a glide, and a ride. After that, though, we're either popping our feet, which is a, a quick, easy, short word to define our top gun drop, or we're going to go three quick, or we're going to go three casual. So we just add those three drops after we add it. I mean, after we execute one of those three fakes, and that's how we get into running and throwing and dropping our play action game. So here, and I'm looking at the clock here, it looks like I'm over, but here, this is just a quick poke fake. It's a three casual drop. He's gonna reload his feet and go to the second look in the play. So Sam's poking, then he's going three casual, and then he's going to reload his feet to the second look. Coach, you tell me when I need to get off. I'll, I'm going to finish this until, uh, you know, as far as you'll let me. Yeah. You the got, most uh, important part, tell me where you are. Do you need me to finish up? Uh, you got about five minutes. I, I know some, five minutes. some guys have some yeah. questions. The most, the most important aspect of everything that we do, in my opinion, is just to understand at the quarterback position and at, and at my coaching position that 
we're not going to be able to stand there and have our feet set in place in a perfect world during the game a majority of the time. So we do all this work on drops and all this work on footwork and all this work on, on, on trigger position and getting the ball out. And then you get in a game and you have to throw off platform more than half the time. And in the SEC and the ACC, the last two conferences I've been in, there's no way you're setting your feet more than 50% of the time. And so probably more important than all the stuff we just talked about is all the drill work we do moving our quarterback to throw the football. This is just a simple example of our guys staying in the trigger position, whether we scramble to the right or to the left, whether we move forward or backward, up or back. I want them to stay in a loose position, upper body wise. I don't want to get tense. And I want them to get really, really uh, comfortable moving around in that trigger position. And then after we get comfortable moving around in that last drill, then we will drop, we'll get into the trigger position, we're going to move in certain directions and throw to targets all over the field. So here we're just sifting left. Now we're going to rush to the right and we're going to throw to targets on our left, over the middle, to our right. And, and you, you know, it's countless different combinations of where to move and where to throw. After we move on open grass, just on verbal direction, then I'll start giving them just subtle movement cues. So they have to move away from where I'm coming, keep their eyes down the field. The whole time that I'm moving, and I'm, I'm just basically jogging at them different targets, I am constantly coaching their eyes or watching their eyes. I want their eyes down the field. They need to see the play and feel the pressure. If you have a quarterback seeing the pressure, you've got problems in, in, in our estimation, our experience. I want them to see what's going on down the field the entire time and feel what's going on around them and react to what they feel with their feet. And, and so that's what we're drilling here. That comes naturally to some, and it, it comes not so naturally to others, and you've got to train it into them. So we're moving in all kinds of directions, and this is kind of a three-quarter speed drill right now until they get really good at it. The, the target is defined as who raises their hands. Sometimes they know it's the target to the left. Sometimes we're going to make them find it. Sometimes they know we're just working on scrambling to the right or stepping up to the right. And other times I'm going to be unpredictable in where I pressure so that they have to just react, find the target, and trigger it. And we do this drill every single day. Here I have them running three-quarter speed. They've got three different targets. They have a target here, GA. They have a target in a player, a target in a player, and they are throwing to the one that shows. And then they'll come, they'll come back on the other, in the other direction in their trigger position, not, not running where they have to turn, in their trigger position, and then find the target and throw. Here we're working. They're going to step. They're top gunning to the left. They don't like it. They're going to subtly, comfortably reload their feet to a second target, and then they're going to move for the third target or the third look. We very rarely ever practice dropping and throwing the first look, dropping, not liking the first look, reloading our feet to the second look and throwing. Uh, we, we do that a lot. We very rarely ever reload our feet to a third look and throw. Once we get to a third look, it's almost automatic in our drills that we have to move and find the third look on the move and off platform. Because very rarely are you ever gonna throw a third look without having to move your feet in a college football game, at least, at least not in the last two conferences that I've been coaching. In. And then the last, the, the last thing I would say, and I have some clips here of it in Skelly. This is us moving for the third look and making a throw. So our quarterback here is, he's in a three casual drop. He's getting ready to trigger the first look. He didn't like it. He reloaded his feet to the second look, didn't like it. The third look he's getting out, and he's going to make the throw on the move. And then if you notice in Skelly here, as funny as it may be to you, we have all of our managers um, as defensive linemen. And, and as we get more involved, they'll actually run stunts and three-man games and all that fun stuff at our quarterback because I don't ever want him feeling nothing but grass in front of him because he'll never feel that in a game. 
it's a lot more realistic to have four bodies moving closer to him, him having to throw in time and, and move away from pressure. So ultimately, we may have him have this manager move out of the way. And these guys move out of the way and there'll be space in here. And we may step up in the middle. We may have them all slant one way and he'll slide to where the space is. And it's a lot more realistic uh, situation in Skelly. You know, I saw the clinic where Lincoln Riley talked about, you know, how little he felt Skelly was helpful. And in some ways, I really agree with him because there are aspects of Skelly that don't mirror a real game. And this is one of the biggest aspects that don't. And I think it makes our Skelly better and more effective for our guys because they're still working on movement and they're still getting people moving at them, uh, even though it's not a true D line. And so I think it's a little bit more beneficial than when you used to do this without anybody in front of us. And then the last drill I'm going to skip forward to, and I think this is really helpful, um, is a drill that I do where I hold the, uh, where I have a GA hold the shield. And we run right at a defender, and we run right at the quarterback while he's throwing. And it's just to further enforce or insist him, uh, insist that he keep his eyes down the field while he has pressure coming at him. And so this, this is the drill that I'm talking about. And again, I'm just jogging at him and I have a shield and, and I'll whack the heck out of him after a while. But he's got his eyes down the field at a target, another player or a GA or an injured player. And he's going to stand and throw as he's, he knows pressure's coming at him. I want him to stand in with his eyes down the field, knowing he's going to get hit. And then we give him a shot. You know, not a shot that's going to break a finger or damage him in any way, but I'll give him a shot to the ribs or the belly or the thighs or the shoulder late so that he gets a shot while he's throwing. And it, it really – hey, come uh, enlarge this for me, Coach, again. I hit a button. It really helps train our guys. And, and, and to some extent, you know, you got to be careful that you don't train it so much that they stand in too long because that's what will happen at times. And that's what we, what we want. Sam doesn't dance around and try to run away from a lot of people. Um, he did do that in high school. I think he does it even more now. And I, I'd like to pat ourselves on the back and think it's because of the drill. But he really just does this naturally. Some of our guys don't. And we help them get to this point by drilling, getting hit while they're throwing in practice. And that's a small, small little microcosm of what we do just in the pass, pass game with drops and with throws off of pressure and movement um, in the world of our quarterback and their development and the air raid stuff that, um, you know, we, we utilize. That's a small aspect of uh, the drill work that we have on their positional checklist, developing our guys. And, of course, we have a drill library for the screen game and a drill library for the run game. So I'll leave it there, Coach, and if, if, you, if somebody has some questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Yeah, we got to um... – I know the one of the main things is uh, some of the guys are just looking for that drill tape, Coach. Uh, I don't know if you, if you want to share with me. I can put it on the drive, so um, they can just access it with, without you sending it out to a bunch of different people. Um, but that's totally up so to you. When we're done here, I'll I'll, I'll have uh, I'll have our quality control guy send it to you, and then yes, you can it to whoever wants it. No, absolutely. And guys, feel free to uh, you know contact Coach on Coach. Can, do you mind just sharing uh, your Twitter handle or email? My email uh, is, what is my email, Coach? Longo13? Longo13 at ad.edu. Longo13 at ad. Oh, UNC. Say it again then. Longo13 at ad.edu. Longo13 at ad.unc.edu. That's my email here at the office. Awesome. You can tell how much I use it. <laughs> and he's also on Twitter, guys, so feel free to reach out and uh, ask any questions. I, I know we didn't get to a bunch of the questions here. Uh, we got to get set up for the next one. But, Coach, I can't thank you enough for spending some time with us, man, and, and, and bringing us through that. It was really great. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Absolutely, Coach. Thank you.